Hey everybody, so EU5 has done a reveal of their work in progress map of Europe. At the very least, Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Asia, India, the Middle East, and some bits of Africa. And I wanted to talk about this because I play a lot of EU4, I did play a lot of EU4, and now we're on to EU5. And I want to talk about the historical background of all these different areas, what's causing this setup, what is happening here, what are the gameplay implications, what are the historical implications of all this, because I played a lot of EU4. And I played a lot of you for at the, let's, I'm going to call it the high end. Uh, I, I know some of you guys are probably annoyed that I always say this and give away my credentials, but I think it's good to give away my credentials because it kind of lets people know I'm not just some like random fan of the game. I played a lot of it. Uh, I played a lot of you for multiplayer for five, six, seven years. I ran my own uh, multiplayer community. I ran an actual multiplayer mod where I personally worked with a lot of the files, did a lot of rebalancing, things like that. So I have I have a lot of thousands of hours into EU4. I play pretty much every Paradox game. I play Total War games. I play all these sorts of games. And I think I have a good background for, let's say, game theory on a lot of these different areas. And in addition to that, um, I know a lot of history and I definitely have looked into a lot of the uh, background in locations like this. I, I, I've actually done a lot of, um, I shouldn't say a lot, I've done a little bit of research to make sure I know exactly what's going on in the world of 1337. So what I'm going to be doing now is we're going to be talking about each different area here and we're going over historically what's going on, what are the gameplay implications, what's going to happen. Okay, so we're going from the top left down. Now we're going to ignore Iceland because it's, it's Iceland, okay? So what do we got going on here in the English Isles and France? Okay, so on the English Isles right now, we have Scotland and Beloyal. Um, this area right here, these people right here, these are English pretenders who are trying to take over the Scottish throne. The Scottish throne. Scotland is currently in a civil war, uh, being backed up by England. Unfortunately, England is about to not support their pretenders as much because they're going to start focusing on France. So Scotland, right at game start, has a bit of an issue where they are very much in a civil war. Bad things are happening, and they're going to have a bit of a tough game start right now. Now in Ireland over here, we can see that the Kingdom of England controls the Pale. Have you ever heard the expression beyond the Pale? Uh, you know, an area of the world that would be uncivilized, barbaric, something that went beyond civility. Well, that would be beyond the Pale, because that would be going into the Irish. It, beyond the Pale is actually an anti-Irish term, if you've ever actually thought about it. Uh, yeah. So, Ireland is mostly controlled by the English here, or at the very least, it's mostly under chieftains. During this time period, England's going to be a, bit, a little bit of a... Uh, you know, wacky situation with France right now. So uh, the Irish will definitely be able to unite or at the very least throw the English out for a little bit. Um, yeah. Now what's going on with France? For the last 200 years, the French have been trying to kick the English out of France. Uh, a lot of people think the Hundred Years War just sort of sparked up one day and happened, but that's not really what happened. Okay. So we have the Normans, the Normans of Normandy. The Normans are Norse, uh, who settled in Normandy. They're basically Vikings who became French, and they inter intermingled in France, uh, married French women, um, blah, 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 blah. They did that for like 100 years, and then the Norse kings, the Norman kings, uh, invaded England and took over England. Now, after they did that, um, the English, the Norman kings of England, uh, continued to own Normandy under the French. So the French had the king of France, but the English owned Normandy under the French while owning the Kingdom of England on their own. That's how the feudal system works. It's complicated. Under the French, the England came the English came to own about half of France. Most of Western France was owned by the English. So the French have spent the last 200 years slowly revoking uh, English land and slowly pushing them back to try to stabilize their realm and to try to prevent an English takeover over the Kingdom of France. Right now, the French king is dead, and um, the English have argued that they should inherit the throne through one of uh, the women who is related to the king. The king died without an heir, and he died without like any heirs at all. Now, the French are arguing that because women cannot have the throne, that you cannot inherit through a woman, because a woman cannot pass on inheritance that she herself could not maintain. Which the Pope accepted, and everyone generally accepted this as true. You can't inherit through a woman because a woman can't be king anyway. Okay, so the English said, whatever, that's fine, we're not going to push the matter anymore. Now the French want to continue to push the English out completely, especially because the English have now kind of made like half a play through for the, for the throne. 
So the, the French are kind of wary. They're like, ooh, this could be bad. So they want to take Gascony away from the English. Now, Aquitaine down here, this is a English possession. Aquitaine uh, is a very prosperous, very rich trading region that the English very much do not want to lose. And the French want to remove all of Gascony down here. When they say that, the English go, no, you can't do that, and now we're going to push our claim onto the throne again, because now the English just want to push their claim onto the throne and just remove the French once and for all. Ready, game start. Um, the Hundred Years' War kicks off. That's 115 years of on and off warfare between the French and the English. Um, that's basically the setup for what's going on here. Now, what are the gameplay implications of this? Here's a problem, um, and, and, I've, and I noticed EU4 had the exact same problem. Um, the problem here is, is that in game theory, there's really no reason for the English to try to hold on to Aquitaine. If they just surrender Aquitaine right at game start and maintain their island, instead of losing control over Scotland, they can push their pretenders onto the throne and take over Scotland. Then instead of losing Ireland, they can just quick take over Ireland. They can consolidate control over Wales and they control the entirety of the British Islands maybe in 20 years. That would be very powerful for them and very successful. The French, likewise, don't want to fight out a hundred years war because that's ridiculous. So they're going to just try to immediately take out Aquitaine um, and then consolidate their realm. All these different areas over here, these are French vassals, by the way. That's why they're all blue. So what France wants to do is they want to take out Aquitaine, own that themselves, then slowly remove all these different vassals and recombine France into super France. Do you get it? Okay. Now, this is a problem because if... If me playing France, I'm allowed to immediately kick out the English, or me playing England, I'm allowed to immediately back out of Aquitaine, or in a multiplayer game, both players work together in order to just make that happen instantly, we end up with a massively powerful France that will very much surpass the rest of Europe by far, and we end up with a massively powerful England that will also surpass the, ma the rest of Europe by far. In either situation, we end up in a world where this really won't be fun or interesting for the rest of Europe, because they'll end up with two superpowers that can't really be tamed. So it's on the developers to make there be an actual reason for England to fight for equity. Now, I don't know how they could do that, because one of the problems that you'll notice, or at the very least, you'll probably think to yourself really quickly, is if England gets a debuff, if they get some sort of uh, destability or something, they lose stability or something for losing Aquitaine, well, they're going to lose anyway. The odds of England being able to actually win the Hundred Years' War the entire way through are pretty low. Now, if England does win it, that's probably bad balance because having control over England and France kind of wins the game in like a very short period of time. No one else in Europe will be able to oppose you or even really do much of anything. So that would probably be pretty bad for game balance to allow that to happen. So we have to understand that England will probably at some point eventually lose the Hundred Years' War. Even if they do start in a stronger position with a more powerful army, um, France should eventually have some mechanics or something to pull it back and win in the future. But the problem here is England can just eat the debuff, eat whatever penalty they get for losing Aquitaine, and then take over the English, uh, the, the British Islands. So that's going to be the problem that the developers need to, at some point, they need to address that. And there needs to be some incentive for England to actually try to fight for the land, be it that there might be some sort of peace or that maybe England could eventually, like, just sort of maintain something down here and it could leave French claims or something. I, I don't I don't know. I don't really know how they could actually make a system that encourages France to, you know, a, allow England to control land, but there you go. Let's move down to Iberia. So the Reconquista has been going on for like 500 years now, on and off fighting between the Christians and the Muslims. So right now, and basically for the last 200 years, because remember this is 1337, for the last 200, but realistically for almost the last 300 years, maybe not the exact 300, but at least for like the last 250 years, the 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 christian kingdoms have definitely been control of the reconquista they very rarely lose land they just make slow inevitable expansion and the muslims were getting pushed back a lot so why did it take so long because north african kingdoms the almorvids the al homovids something like that um those two kingdoms pushed up and eventually managed to kind of push back the 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 reconquista a little bit and then eventually they got pushed back so North African Kingdom came up, stalled them, got pushed. Another one came up, stalled them, got pushed. Now Morocco is here to do the same thing, to try to stall them out for like another hundred years. Can they do it? I don't know. At game start, we can see Morocco has some sieges. Um, these little stripes mean that they've sieged this land in Tlekmen. Um, 
they control it, and eventually they're going to conquer Tlekman. Uh, that's because right after game start, Morocco should conquer Tlekman. Now, Morocco should have a population disadvantage on Castile, but Castile and Portugal should be able to ally and unite and push back Morocco. Morocco, on the other hand, should have a stronger army at game start and be a uh, potential um, threat to Castile and Portugal. Granada and Morocco should be... If they want to make it a good game, um, they should be, maybe Morocco should be 30 to 40% as strong as Castile and Portugal. So that maybe, you know, it takes Castile and Portugal a bit of time to push them back. Uh, I think overall, obviously, the Spanish should win because they're kind of important. This game goes from 1337 to the 1800s, uh, the early 1800s, but let's say at the very least 1800. During that period of time, Spain was pretty important. So it's pretty important that Spain does eventually win, but Morocco needs to be strong enough that Morocco can hold them back from completing the Reconquista for like another hundred years, which is going to be difficult. Aragon over here. Um, Aragon has lost Provence to, well, you'd guess it, Provence. Um, Aragon used to own this land here, and Provence has now inherited it, and now they own it. So Aragon is in control over most of, um, oh, what's that area called? Sardinia. Uh, so Aragon will start the game, and they're going to ignore this situation down here. Aragon should control over Sardinia. They should then try to take over Corsica from Genoa, and then they should try to push for Sicily, as they did historically. Then Aragon can try to take over Naples. Now, Aragon might still have claims over Provence here. I don't know if they will or if they won't, but uh, we could see a sea empire of Aragon over here, where they kind of end up owning maybe not this land from France, but depending on their claims and depending on what happens, they could end up owning Provence, Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, push up through Naples, and you could end up owning a superpower, a super Italian slash Spanish power of Aragon, which is technically what they did historically. They did get the islands here, the uh, Sicily here, and then they did get Naples. So they were actually a large uh, power here, but uh, they did eventually get inherited by Castile, and that happened there. So what's going on in Italy? Um, let me get some water here. In Italy, we have an interesting situation here where um, the Renaissance is about to start kicking off and the Italians are about to lead it. So despite the Italians being much smaller, weaker powers, um, actually, historically, the Italians have managed to keep... Um, they haven't managed to keep everyone out. There, there have been some periods of time and there will be some periods of time where the French will be able to push in here, where the Holy Roman Empire will be able to push in here. But uh, once Venice is at the height of its power, Venice will punch way ahead of its weight. Uh, Milan will get conquered. Naples will be able to push ahead of its weight. Uh, and the Italians will be able to push very much larger than you're physically seeing here. They will be able to hit pretty hard and do pretty well. Uh, the Renaissance Age is when the Italians didn't manage to unite, but if they did, they would have been pretty powerful. Now, I did look into the history here. You can see Venice. Um, they're kind of the uh, these these people over here. You see them kind of on the coast over. They're not very large, but they are very rich historically. Now, what did happen, and I tried to look up the history on this, and it was very confusing. They managed to take these deep blue people, Aquilia, here, and then they took Verona. And they basically conquered both these powers without anyone really doing anything. So all of a sudden, Venice went from a sea power that was just rich but didn't control much land to all of a the sudden they managed to control a lot of land. So what's what Venice is going to do? Milan controls Lombardia, and they're going to try to consolidate control over um, central um, Italy over here. And they're just going to try to use their very high population uh, for a city. They've got a very rich city, and they should... If, if the game works the way it should, Italy should get the Renaissance first and technologically be ahead of the rest of Europe and realistically the rest of the world uh, by a good bit of time. Down here in central Italy, uh, we got Florence is in control over... Well, they're, 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 they have Florence. I, I'm not really sure what's going to go on here in central Italy. We've got um, the Papal States. That's a Pope's land. The Pope will eventually come to kind of eat all these little dudes over here. Florence will eat these little dudes going on to the south. I'm not really sure who's going to win here. Historically speaking, neither of them really won. So the more interesting powers to look out for over here are Venice, when they eventually become interested in conquering land. And uh, that, that's really about it for Italy. 
No one else really did anything. I, I hope they represent Venice well, and I hope they become a very powerful power. So what's going on over here in the Holy Roman Empire? Oh boy, not a lot is going on here. Um, so in 1337, there you you might say there is some things with a golden bull and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, that made this area more interesting. But for the most part, the big power players in the region are going to be Bohemia, Austria, and that's about it. Um, Bavaria is split in two here. We can see Upper Bavaria and Lower Bavaria. If Bavaria does, does manage to unite and... Um, I mean, they could maybe do some stuff. But realistically speaking, the winners of the Holy Roman Empire at this point in time are so far above everyone else. Bohemia, who has all these areas as their vassals. And Austria, who will manage to inherit Tyrol from their family. That's the Hebsburgs. Uh, a very powerful Austria and a very powerful Bohemia will basically be the dominant powers over the Holy Roman Empire here, with not really anyone else able to challenge them. Brandenburg in the future will be able to, but you have to consider that at game start, Brandenburg is just a northern German swamp woods thing at this point in time. It's not really a notable power. It doesn't really do anything. It is larger physically than their neighbors, but it doesn't really mean that much because there's not really a lot of people that live here. It's just not very powerful. Um, historically, these are the people who formed Germany, but it, unless they give them some really big game start buffs, there's really no reason for Brandenburg to really be that much more powerful than everyone else around them. Up in Scandinavia, okay, so historically speaking, what happened in Scandinavia is Denmark managed to inherit Sweden and Norway and make the Kalmar Union, a super state Scandinavian power. Ready game start though, unfortunately. Denmark is at the low end. They're pretty much at their lowest point historically. Um, their land will unironically start to be bought off by German powers. They're very poor, they're very downtrodden. Uh, the Viking Age has been over for like 300 years now. There's just nothing going on right now, unfortunately, for the poor Danes. They, they just have nothing going on. They will eventually, at some point, manage t to take Scania back from Sweden. They will form the Kalmar Union. They will spend about 100 years being relevant. Right at game start, they're going to lose um, Estonia to the Livonian Order, who I'll go through in a second. And they're going to start having chunks of their mainland. Um, at the very least, the islands are going to start being bought by German merchants. So, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, Denmark should end up being uh, strong enough. I mean, maybe not. We'll have to see what they do, because the developers are Swedish, right? But Denmark should have, like, some bad events or, or something that they need to go through that eventually they can end up very powerful and end up kind of becoming... You know at least somewhat relevant at time right now sweden in the same way should end up maybe being a bit weaker um they need to continue their colonization here of finland and then they need to get owned by the danes and then they need to break out and then they need to technologically become way more militaristically relevant than the rest of europe and then they need to fall off again I don't know what they're going to do for Sweden and Denmark. I don't really know what they can do here. Part of the problem is the areas of the world that they kind of lord over are Poland and Lithuania. Poland and Lithuania have a lot of uh, issues at GameStart already. So if these two are given historical directives to go mess with these people, when they're already, you know, being messed with by the Teutons and Livonians, it might turn a little bit bad. Now, what Sweden and Denmark could do, um, it depends on how strong the Holy Roman Empire is. But what Sweden and Denmark could do is try to, you know, once they consolidate their power, they could try to get down back here and start taking over, um, you know, the bits of the, the coastal Europe, at the very least coastal Germany. I don't know what they'll do. Either way, the HRE seems to very much be a playground kind of area, um, kind of an anything goes sort of area. Um, I, I don't the, historically, obviously, Austria ends up becoming emperor. They end up inheriting Bohemia. They end up becoming the most powerful area for the majority of this game's time frame. Uh, there was like one point in time where Prussia was like a little bit stronger, and that's about it. And Brandenburg isn't Prussia, definitely. And they're like 300 years off getting anything done. So all I can say is these two are going to be the big powers to look for. That's what's going on. That's really all I know about that area. As for Scandinavia, I don't really know how they're going to represent anything here. They're going to have a difficulty because um, Denmark definitely needs to start weaker. It shouldn't just start strong, and they definitely need to get Scania back from Sweden. So we'll see what they do there. We'll see. Now, 
As we move eastward, we're going to talk about Poland, Lithuania, the Teutonic Order, and the Livonian Order. We're not going to talk about whatever is going on over here quite yet. So, as of game start, the Teutonic Order got a uh, the the Papal Order, the directive to um, go convert all the people of Prussia. This is Prussia right here. They got an order, they went and crusaded them, and they forced converted them all to Catholicism. Now, whenever you think of, like, the evil holy order, you know, the, the crusaders who force everyone to convert by the sword, they, you know, blah, 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 blah. Those are the Teutons. Most of the other holy orders were not really any worse than anyone else at the time. And in many ways, um, you could say that they did pretty good. So, for example, the Knights Hospitalar were literally just the Knights Hospital. The, um... Knights Templar were just trying to protect missionaries. Or not missionaries, um, um, oh, what's the other thing? People visiting Jerusalem at the time. So, although, you know, they, they were a holy order, they, they did probably participate in wars, battles, slaughters of heretics. Um, you know, realistically, for the time period, they weren't any worse. Now, that doesn't apply to the Teutonic Order. The Teutonic Order and the Livonian Order, these are like the evil holy orders. These are like the evil Germanics, okay? Uh, anyone who plays Warhammer 40k, you probably know that the Knights Templar are kind of, eh, you know, not exactly good guys all the time. And that's kind of because they're based on the Teutonic Order a lot. The Teutonic Order eventually does basically get abandoned by Christian Europe because everyone's kind of done with them. Uh, eventually, the Teutonic Order kind of turns like, they, they keep doing enough like evil shit that Europe's like, okay, could you guys just stop? You know, they, they kind of lose support, as even the Pope is like, Ugh. But for now, uh, the Duchy of Lithuania is primarily... I, I don't know if it's, like, officially converted at this point, but it was pagan. Um, I think it is still pagan at this point in time. Uh, most of its land is still pagan. And uh, the Teutonic Order is using their official decree to invade Livonia. You can see they've actually got this siege. Now, this point in time, I'm not really sure what they're trying to represent. Um, the Teutonic Order kind of screwed over Poland. Poland gave them some land on a lease, and they said, look, you can use this land to stage your crusade against the Prussian people. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll back you up, just don't do anything weird. So the Teutons annexed the land, which the Polish were like, yo. And now the Teutons are fighting Poland, and they're fighting the Lithuanians. Now, Poland and Lithuania have allied because the Teutonic Order and the Livonian Order um, keep trying to conquer them. It doesn't get any better. Yes, the Teutonic Order and the Livonian Order spend a lot of their time fighting Christians. They've already been defeated by the Christian uh, Novgorod. That was called the Battle on Ice. Um, the Teutonic Order tried to invade Christian people in Novgorod. Those are kind of the proto-Russians at this point in time. And, and tried to convert them to Christianity, even though they were Christian. And it's very clear they just wanted to conquer their land. Now they're kind of doing the same thing to Poland, and you can argue the Lithuanians still have many pagans and haven't, I, I don't know if they've officially converted, I probably should have looked that up, but uh, this is when Europe still supports them, and you know, there's still, there's still a lot of pagans in Lithuania, so they still have a lot of support from Europe. Um, that'll start to wane, Poland will eventually defeat them, but at this point in time, um, the Teutons aren't exactly at the height of their power. The height of their power would probably have been a hundred years ago. But as of right now, they should still be about equal with Poland and Lithuania. The Teutons and Livonians should be about equal with these two. So who wins is kind of up in the air. Uh, Poland should win as they did historically. But, uh, you know, at this point in time, if they're trying to represent the real numbers, Poland and Lithuania have more people, but the Teutonic Order and the Livonian Order have much more support from Europe. They have an influx of knights coming in from the west that is giving them many high-quality troops, equipment, etc. Okay. So I'm looking over here. What's finally going on over here? Well, let's zoom out for a bit so you can see it. Genghis Khan is dead. His son is dead. His son's son is dead. His son's son, 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 son is dead. They're all dead. Uh, the the Genghis's horde, the Mongol Empire has broken up. The Golden Horde is one of the largest geographically. It's one of the largest remnants of the Mongol Horde. Now, for those guys who do know, the Mongol Horde absolutely ravaged Eastern Europe. They burnt. Eastern Europe was already behind Western Europe as it was, and then the Mongols came through, subjugated them, 
burned many of their cities, slaughtered their people, and it's been like that for like a hundred years right now. Um, they are under what is called the Tartar Yoke. This means they're under control of the steppe people. Uh, this is obviously pretty humiliating for them, but it's an existence that they have to just put up with because the Tartar people have slaughtered their armies every single time and no one can possibly get rid of them. So, of course, prominently we have here Muscovy. Muscovy is who eventually formed Russia. Muscovy, I think it's called. Muscovy uh, is a powerful city, although you might look at the Grand Republic of Novgorod and Muscovy and you might think, well, how could these people ever lose to these people? I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure the population numbers are basically the same. Because Novgorod's got, obviously, the city of Novgorod, which I think is here, should be. And then I think they have another one down here, but that's about it. Muscovy, of course, is still populated over here. Um, Muscovy, I believe, basically just kind of threw their hands up and started to work with the Tartars. They just paid their taxes on time. They, they just gave them whatever they wanted. They realized that there was realistically nothing they could do to oppose them anymore. They kind of gave up. And because of that, they're not really being treated that poorly. They're, they're kind of prospering. Not Maybe not prospering is the right way to put it, but they're not being hit as hard as the other people. Now, all this area has been massively depopulated. I shouldn't say massively. It has been depopulated, though. A lot of their people have fled the land. A lot of their people have been slaughtered. And so what will happen, uh, historically speaking, what did happen during this time period, is Poland eventually conquered down south, Lithuania eventually conquered down south, and both these powers ended up owning a lot of this depopulated area over here. This entire area was owned by Poland and Lithuania. Muscovy took the time to eventually uh, oppose the Tartar yoke, even though it took them like a hundred years to start building enough of power to do it so if you do play a game in muscovy you will likely be spending the entirety of your early game slowly building up your technology slowly building up your army um slowly usurping your neighbors then getting burnt down by the lithuanians then trying to do it again and then eventually you should be able to throw off the tartar yoke so that will basically be the game plan of Eastern Europe. So we have the Livonian Order and the Teutonic Order will oppose Poland and Lithuania. Muscovy, or maybe some other power, will slowly be building up enough power to eventually throw off the Tartar yoke. Presumably, the Golden Horde will not scale well. Presumably, it will split into multiple smaller tribes on its own, as it did. Historically, the Golden Horde did split into smaller, um, smaller hordes. And then eventually, the Russian people will be able to oppose them. Um... Worth noting is the battle that eventually threw off the Tartar yoke was not actually a battle at all. Uh, basically, the Muscovites raised an army and told the Tartars that they were no longer going to pay their tribute. The two armies met in the battlefield, they looked at each other, and they both actually went home. And that was the end of the Tartar yoke. After, <laughs> after like 250 years of brutal subjugation, the Russian people kind of just looked at their enemies until they walked away. And that was the end of that. So that'll be the main game plan for Eastern Europe. Now, Novgorod is hit the least hard because the Mongols never really managed to get up that far. So the city of Novgorod should be a very rich merchant people. Novgorod, on the other hand, should be more how you picture Russia today. A very powerful monarch sitting on a throne. So your two gameplay styles here should either be Novgorod with a very more liberal mindset, with a very more... Um, freedom-minded people, and Muscovy down here should be a very much more, you know, for the time, more uh, uh, average kind of monarch group, okay? So that, that should basically be the gameplay of Eastern Europe and what they do with that. As they're perm in these things, I don't, I don't think they're going to matter or do anything. Not really. Okay, so that's this area over here. Gameplay as a Golden Horde will probably be modernizing as quickly as you can in trying to modernize quicker than your western vassals do or at the very least maybe trying to you eat your western vassals i mean i guess that is a gameplay concern could the golden horde just slowly eat all their western vassals could they slowly just incorporate them into their realm so that nobody eventually rebels against them so that eventually they just sort of manage to combine all their wealth can they modernize in a rapid enough state or will they just have some sort of disaster or event system slowly splitting them apart so that you know basically will it be possible to maintain the golden horde and if so that would be pretty overpowered 
but if not, how difficult will it be and how much land can you maintain while you slowly split apart? Okay, so now let's look over here into the other side of Eastern Europe, Hungary. So Hungary often... Bohemia and Hungary, what's the right way to put this? Bohemia often supported the Teutonic Order uh, because they opposed Poland. Hungary often supported the Teutonic Order as well. Poland and Lithuania were not having a fun time. Okay, let's put it that way. And Poland, uh, which was a very prosperous, rich region, did manage to actually prosper uh, after they managed to throw all these people off of them. But Poland is having a very difficult time. Hungary, on the other hand, has managed to inherit much of the kingdom of uh, Croatia. I think they inherited it. I don't think they conquered it. And they will inherit the rest of Croatia over this game's uh, time period. Bosnia. I don't know what happened to Bosnia. I don't think it gets eaten. I think it just sort of exists there for the rest of this time period. Hungary doesn't do much in this time period. In a hundred years, they will eventually try to oppose the Ottomans uh, multiple times over and over and over. Um, they will fail. But for now, I don't think they do much. I don't really know what's going on with Hungary during this time period. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what's going on there. As for Serbia, Bulgaria, the Byzantine Empire, and the Ottomans, um, with the collapse of the Eastern Roman Empire due to the Fourth Crusade, the Latin Empire was formed. Now, the Latin Empire is when the Italians and Aragon tried to control the Eastern Roman Empire. The former Greeks then managed to retake the Greek Empire from them. The Byzantine Empire at this point should really just be called the Greek Empire. They really can't really call themselves the Roman Empire anymore. So at this point, it's like 100% the Byzantine Empire, the Greek Empire. No one should really be calling this the Roman Empire anymore. But these are the Greeks who've managed to overthrow the Italians, and they've managed to get their shit back together. Unfortunately, over here in Anatolia, we can see these are all Turkic powers. The Kanderids, Turks, Ottomans, Turks. You might not believe that the Ottomans are actually Turks. The Kirisids, Turks, Saru Sar Saruhanids, Turks. All of these guys are Turks. All these people are Turks. Um, and so the Ottomans should hopefully have some gameplay making them outrageously powerful. Uh, I think within like 50 years of game start, they've already conquered up into Bulgaria. So like... The Ottomans should be able to take this game by storm, and at the very least take Western Anatolia and Bulgaria within like 50 years pretty consistently. <laughs> now what did happen here is the Serbian Empire managed to actually beat the Byzantines and take much of Greece from them. This of course weakened the Byzantines who got, you know, pounded down by the Ottomans, and uh, that should basically be the big showdown here, the Serbians against the Ottomans. Now historically... What happened is a bit ambiguous, but it was pretty much the biggest disaster for the Serbians. And one of the biggest disasters in all human history. Sorry, Serbians. The Serbian army was very large, very powerful, and was very capable of beating the Ottoman army. The Ottoman army... And I, and I shit you not, if what I'm remembering was actually what happened, and I think it's what happened, they basically sent a bunch of saboteurs who lit some of the camp on fire. The Serbian army went into complete panic. And I, and I assure you, this is true. They went into complete panic, had a huge stampede, a lot of them died, and the army eventually disintegrated, and the Ottomans were able to, you know, take much of their land back from them, which then allowed the Ottomans to control you know, pretty much Greece and Western Anatolia. Um, In-game, though, the Serbian Empire should at the very least pose a little bit of a challenge here. Uh, the Bulgarians, I don't think, managed to do much. Sorry, Bulgars. You guys kind of just got whooped on. Um, <laughs> there, there wasn't really much of a contest there. The Byzantines also pretty much just got whooped on. Sorry, there shouldn't be much contest there. Now, what I'm hoping is the big two winners in the region should be Serbia and the Ottomans. I'm hoping that these two have um, a lot of, at the very least, unique power to them. I really hope this isn't just watching the, the, the Byzantines. Oop. I should turn that off. Why is it still on? Ah, whatever. Um, hopefully, the Byzantines do not just end up being super powerful and, and just sort of dominating over, um, you know, Anatolia and Greece, because that would, that'd be pretty lame. And, uh, I really, I really hope that they avoid that. I, I don't want this to be another Bizaboo game. 
I don't want the Romo files to own this. This region at this point historically should 100% be a showdown between the Serbians and the Ottomans for who gets to rule. The Ottomans should obviously have the edge, but I think realistically, I think the Serbians should actually be able to potentially hold their own and i definitely think there should be a world where much like morocco i think there should be like a 30 percent chance maybe maybe like at least like a 10 to 20 percent chance that the serbians actually come out of this one on top they kind of positioned themselves well they were they were making large gains right up until they died the ottomans though should be completely dominant um the ottoman power in this time was was completely insane they were just way more powerful than anyone else and, and again i just hope at the very least we just don't get another bizaboo game i really hope the byzantines are just smacked with all kinds of debuffs because they should really not be the power in this region despite reconquering much of greece they were really not that strong right now okay so we've done this area 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 there's not a whole lot going on in Tunis. There's not a whole lot going on in Tripoli. Tripoli. Not a lot going on there. So this brings us to the Memluk Sultanate of Egypt. Um, this one's going to be a difficult one to go over. I don't know what they're going to do about the Mamluks. Um, they're obviously extraordinarily powerful at this point in time. Now, I'm hoping they have some sort of disaster or internal gameplay to go over. Because the Mamluks are so powerful right at game start compared to every neighbor that they will basically just completely conquer everyone and run over the game if there isn't some horrible debuff or mechanic to keep them under control uh so, so i'm really hoping there is some mechanic i'm hoping there's something that keeps them under control uh, a disaster a debuff something otherwise what we're gonna see is we're gonna see the mamluks just reforming the ottoman empire under mamluk control uh so that's all I have to say about that one. Now, as we push into Baghdad, what we can see here is much like the Golden Horde, we can see the offshoots, the um, remnants here of the uh, the Mongol Empire, the um, Chobanids, the Musaf Musafarids, the Jal Jalayirids. Um, I think almost all these big powers here, the Sutayids. Is it the Sutayids? I think they are also Mongol. Most of these big powers um, are actually just the Mongol successor states right now. The Persians basically have no control over their domain. Um, that will come in after game start, maybe 150 years, the Persians will be able to get control over their own land. As of right now, it's basically Mongols and Turks fighting over the region for at least about 100 years, 120 years right now. But. Uh, now the Persian Empire is a good bit away, so you can choose one of the Mongol successor states, and I guess you could try. I don't know what gameplay they're gonna use. Can you eventually like try to to mingle into the realm? Can I, you know, control the Jalayirids? Can I control them? Can I try to Persiafy myself? Could I try to Iraqify myself? Could I try to mingle in with the regular culture, modernize my state and become an actual power? Or am I kind of doomed to irrelevance as I slowly fall off technologically? And as you know, the, the fact that I control like 0.1% of my culture is actually Mongol in my realm, right? Like, am I slowly just going to fall off and become irrelevant? Well, that's, I guess what we're going to see. Because almost all these powers here are some sort of Mongol successor state. The Akatudes are the Satsutayids are if they're if one of these isn't correct to me but I'm pretty sure almost all of these are Mongol powers these three aren't obviously but uh, all the big ones are all Mongol powers so we'll see what's going on there um I, I don't really know how they're going to represent it because right now if I want to play Persia I don't think there's really anything I can click if I want to play like an actual Persia Persia which is a bit odd to say the least um lastly over here we have georgia this is like one of the only time periods where georgia isn't getting ravaged by all their neighbors so it'll be interesting to see if georgia is like actually a viable pick right now because it does look so long as georgia avoids this thing up here it does look like georgia could potentially just take over the mountains you know uh they, they should be the same culture group as the armenians so Georgians should be able to conquer the Armenians 
and and kind of like reform like a little kingdom here and actually kind of maybe sort of become relevant i know this area isn't very populated because it's a mountainous region it's probably not great land because it's a mountainous region but at the very least there's no one as of right now who's just gunning for them now timmer timmer is a giga conqueror now timmer comes through forms the Timurid Empire, and absolutely ravages this region. Um, he's the one who basically destroys the Ottomans and stops them for like 50 years. Timur comes through, takes over all of Persia, all of Iraq. He pushes into Western Anatolia. He beats the Ottomans in battle, kidnaps the Sultan, kills him. Well, I don't know if it's actually said that he kills him, but... Um, anyway, Timur should come through. If they want this game to be historical, Timur should come through about ooh, 40 years from game start and just destroy the region so we'll see what happens with that one if he's going to be a playable area if he's going to be and and timmer is a large reason by the way why the golden horde was also slowed down as well he he is a very important historical character he slowed down the ottomans he slowed down the golden horde he gave a lot of people now he was obviously a very evil genocidal murderer he even though i i call i call my wi-fi a uh, timmer lane um but you know uh he, he was obviously a horrible 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 person but for the purposes of history he was very important for giving europe some breathing room because he slowed down the Giga Golden Horde and beat the crap out of them a lot. He slowed down the Ottomans and beat the crap out of them a lot. He beat the crap out of the Mamluks as well. So he was very important for slowing down these huge empires from being able to push westward. And that's what I was kind of talking about earlier. If there's no Timur, that means the Ottomans could potentially combine, you know, their all of Anatolia and Greece and they could start pushing westwards 50 years earlier than they did historically. And if they're pushing westwards 50 years earlier, that means Hungary doesn't have time to prepare anything. That means Austria definitely doesn't have time to prepare anything. That means the Renaissance isn't even spreading fully through Europe. So if, if there's no Timur, we're definitely going to be running into some problems with Europe. Uh, if there's no Timur slowing down the Golden Horde, they could very well potentially just completely swallow all their western vassals and never even give russia a chance okay so we just have mongol successor states all over here as for arabia um nothing really interesting with arabia there's yemen but yemen's never allowed to do anything <laughs> uh there's oman or oman which should form hormuz right now they call it ormus um Actually, no, I think Hormuz conquers those. So maybe Ormus. I don't know. Anyway, this area should be mined into Hormuz. It doesn't really do anything. And there you go. As for India, this is the last area over here. So India is once again doing that thing where they don't really matter because they've been completely conquered by the Sultanate of Delhi. There's a problem with India. They kind of get conquered by people all the time. So I, I was kind of talking about this on stream yesterday, but let me go through it again. The problem with the conquests of India is once you get through the Punjab area, this is the Punjab area. Once you get through the Punjab area and you start conquering Northern India, you now control at the time, the richest area of the world. This area right here is the richest area of the world. So you go through here and you just stomp over these flat plains. Once you do this, you're now the most powerful empire in the world. Then once you do that, you avoid the jungles of the east, you push down along the coast, and you tank over the central plains here, and now you're just an unstoppable gigaforce. Now you own the majority of India. At that point, you just slowly start consolidating your realm while conquering everything, and you are now the richest empire in the world. This happened multiple times for like 800 years, this kept happening. So... Much like our good pal Timur, Timur the Genocider, Timur, you'll never believe this, in addition to beating the shit out of the Golden Horde, beating the shit out of the Ottomans, beating the shit out of the Mamluks, Timur is actually the one who ran down here and sacked Delhi. Now, for those of you guys who live in Delhi, you probably don't think that's a very cool thing. You're probably like, yo, what did we ever do to you? But when he did sack Delhi, that slowed down the Sultanate of Delhi who instantly lost control over all of central India, who instantly lost control over large parts of eastern India because their empire had been dealt such a mighty blow. Timur, um, the grand hero that he was, 
now that I think about it, he actually stopped four different empires in their tracks. Timur was like one of history's greatest madmen. You know, here's something funny. After Timur formed his mighty Timurid Empire over like all of this, um, he was actually going to go conquer China again. And he was going to return China to Mongol rule again. But he died on his way there. there. There's an alternate history where Timur actually does manage to take China and conquer it again under Mongol rule. So let that old history fill you with terror. <laughs> So anyway, um, we can see Vijayanagar here. Uh, I don't know if it's Vijayanagara or Vijayanagar. The A at the end seems to sometimes be added or removed on a whim. I'm not sure if it's Vijayanagara or Vijayanagar. Anyway, Vijayanagar was a uh, Hindu state. One of the last Hindu states of India, by the way. Uh, it was a Hindu state that managed to consolidate most of the control over South India. Most of South India got consolidated under their rule and they were able, once the Sultanate of Delhi collapsed here, the Sultanate of Bachmanis was formed up here. Vijayanagara and Bachmanis over here had a giant feud. Vijayanagara uh, actually did manage to defeat Bachmanis, but unfortunately Bachmanis, um, they did like a reverse Voltron and they split into three different Sultanates. Then all those three different sultanates combined their powers and destroyed Vijayanagar. So that's kind of funny when you think about it like there. At the very least, control over southern India should come down to who wins. Uh, hopefully the Sultan of Delhi breaks up or at the very least Bachmanis comes out. Because Vijayanagar and Bachmanis is kind of like... It, it, it wasn't like this huge historical rivalry for hundreds of years, but it was in EU4 and it was one of the biggest rivalries of EU4 because they were both these like pretty large powers who competed for control over southern India. So I kind of hope they bring that back in some way. Uh, as for northern India, I, I'm not really sure what they're going to manage to do here. It pretty much seems consolidated under Mon Muslim rule. And right after the Sultanate of Delhi... They got sacked, they broke apart, they started to rebuild, and you'll never believe this, another Muslim power came through, the Mughals, who, you'll never believe this, conquered the Punjab area, spread through northern India, became the richest empire in the world, and then slowly went down, took the, yeah, yeah, shocking, I know, I know, really, you'll never believe that it happened again. So anyway, that's basically what should be, we're looking at India and what we're looking at here. So so what, what do I think is going to be the most interesting? Obviously, Anatolia looks pretty interesting. There's lots of powers here. There's lots of things that could happen. I'm interested in seeing how strong Serbia will be. The Byzantine Empire, the Ottomans. Um, definitely looking at Georgia. Some old history Georgian strength would go strong here. Looking at the Mamluks, hoping they get a bit confined. Looking at the Jalirids, um, I'm wondering how strong a united uh, Iraq would be, and I'm wondering if they can. I'm wondering if they can form out of being a Mongol successor state into actually being a power in their own right, into potentially being a Persian power. Could they? Could you form Persia under like a Mongol rule? I don't know. Over here in Iberia, we've got the uh, Morocco, Castile, Portugal battles. Uh, again, Castile and Portugal should reasonably win because Spain is pretty important to the modern era. But Morocco, this is basically North Africa's latest, or I should say their last attempt, let's say, to be like a modern, powerful state. Uh, after this, they get thrown out. The climate change happens, not like modern day climate change, but like a climate change happens to northern Africa, where a lot of their, their green land is, is turned into shit land. And that basically ends North Africa's relevancy to actually being powerful. They kind of just become pirate states at that point. As for Italy, I'm really interested in Venice. I've always been a huge Venice fanboy. I'm really interested into them and playing them. They think like I, I think they could be really cool. Milan, a lot of people like Milan because they control the great city of Lombardia uh, or Lombardy. I don't really know which one to call it. Is it Venezia or Venice? I heard some dude might get mad at me if I pronounce it wrong. Uh, Naples over here. Um, now Naples with Napoli should actually be pretty strong. Naples hadn't actually fallen off until Spanish rule. For those of you guys who don't know, one of the reasons Southern Italy is so poor is once the Spanish inherited Southern Italy, Naples, uh, they basically didn't develop it or put any effort into it at all. So while Northern Italy spent like three, four hundred years developing, 
and getting infrastructure and you know actually getting the capability of being a modern state naples just ended up being an agriculture society that's why to this day southern italy is still way more poor but without spanish rule and the ability to actually develop their lands naples should actually end up being a very competent power england and france i'm interested in seeing what's going to go on here you know who's going to win this who's going to lose this and can they just give it up as for uh germany interested to see if they do anything for brandenburg or if they're just doomed interested to see if any of these other states can be relevant or cool i i can't really say now i'm bavarian or the very least my great great ancestors were so you know i'm interested to see can upper bavaria and lower bavaria combine can they uh keep a vote can they keep a vote for the holy roman empire can they actually become a relevant power or are they doomed to failure are bohemia and austria are these going to be the only relevant powers to the greater holy roman empire we don't know uh as for for scandinavia i'm interested to see if denmark can get even close to its historical power and if sweden is just going to be dominant will sweden just keep scania will it just integrate scania and will it then just become super powerful does Denmark have to sell out the Livonian order? And then in the east, and the last interesting thing that I have to look at, who wins? The Teutons and Livonians or Poland and Lithuania? Poland, of course, formed the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, the Lithuanians are, to this day, very upset that it's called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. They always think that, hey, man, we did a lot too, but, you know, did they? Did they? Uh, will the city of Slutsk continue to be a popular tourist attraction? Um, and then lastly, we have over here, who will win between Novgorod and Muscovy? Who will be the most powerful power in the powerful region of power? Will liberalism and trade win? Or will having a powerful army win? <laughs> you know, I, I, I really wonder on that one. What do you guys think? Who will win? A powerful army or um, trade? A tale as old as Roman Carthage, eh? <laughs> so that's the entire EU4 map we know so far. That's everything we know about it. That's my review of it. What do you guys think? You know, leave me a comment. Give me your thoughts on this one. Do you think it looks good? Do you think it looks bad? Do you think it looks interesting? You know, give me your thoughts on this one. And uh, make sure to like. Make sure to subscribe. If you made it this far, you owe me a subscription, right? And uh, as always, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.